Russia has stepped up its attacks across Ukraine, the largest invasion force seen in Europe since the Second World War. And if that's not serious enough, Russia's President Putin has reminded the world of his massive nuclear arsenal by placing it on higher alert. He will seek to apply maximum force. And if nuclear is part of that arsenal, and he feels that he, which it is, and he feels it's going to give him an advantage, uh, I've no doubt that he, we should be prepared for him to use it. That's General Sir Richard Shiref, former Deputy Supreme Commando of the NATO Alliance, and my guest this week from London. It's impossible to predict how this conflict will develop, but it's clear so far that Ukrainian resistance has been more effective than expected, and the Russians appear to have suffered substantial casualties. President Zelensky was given a standing ovation after he spoke to the European Parliament from a bunker somewhere in Ukraine. But what more can and should the West do to help him? Is the NATO alliance a credible deterrent? And how real is the spectre of a third world war? All that and much more on Conflict Zone. General Sir Richard Shiref, welcome to Conflict Zone. You've called Russia's invasion of Ukraine a real and present threat to the NATO alliance. How worried are you by Putin waving his nuclear missiles under the West's nose? Very worried indeed. Putin, Putin will stop at nothing, and we need to recognize the real threat that those words carry. And the threat is what, of a third world war? If, yes, I don't want to be alarmist about this, and one's got to sort of stay cool and calculating, but the reality is this. If Putin conquers Ukraine, and although the Ukrainian people and military are fighting an incredibly brave battle, and we should take inspiration of that, all the, all the odds are, in, are stacked in Putin's favor. So if there is, uh, if he conquers Ukraine, if he occupies Ukraine, I think the chances are that he will have a very, it's a very high chance that he will decide to have a go uh, at establishing, for example, a land corridor through uh, Lithuania to Kaliningrad, a bite off a chunk of the Baltic states. And if there is any Russian incursion whatsoever into NATO territory, that means NATO, all 30 member states, uh, will be at war with Russia. And if NATO is at war with Russia, that means two nuclear-armed nuclear adversaries are locking horns, and that must increase the risk of a nuclear exchange. I want to um, carry on talking about uh, the nuclear problem in a moment, but, but you mentioned the Baltic states. Are they in any way adequately defended by NATO? I have to say that at the moment, given the overwhelming strength of, that the Russians have got, I would be very surprised if they are. What NATO has in place are the enhanced forward battle groups, around about 1,000 personnel in each, in each of the three Baltic states and uh, eastern Poland. I know there has been some reinforcement of those, uh, but I think thus far it's been very much a trickle. I would also add that the NATO response force, we've heard, has been dispatched to, uh, to, to reinforce. But that will take time. And, I mean, from my, my personal perspective, from a professional military perspective, in order to adequately defend the Baltic states, NATO needs to have several armored divisions in those states, together with all the air maritime support assets necessary to fight a major war. And there's a, I think we're probably a long way short of that. What do you put that down to? Why, why are these reinforcements taking so long? What's, what's NATO waiting for, from your experience as uh, Deputy Supreme Commander? Well, NATO, NATO, don't get me wrong, NATO is a great, a great alliance. It's a great institution, and it's been the most successful alliance the world has seen for some 70 years. But it, has to, but it is a consensus organization. It has to move at the speed of the slowest ship in the convoy, and decisions take time to be made. Um, I wish it were otherwise. The whole issue of the science of war, the science of readiness, the, readiness, the, the preparation and movement of significantly large uh, troop numbers is, is, takes an immense amount of time, an immense amount of logistic effort. Uh, and also, we have to recognize that NATO, the NATO, the armed forces of NATO, particularly in Europe, have been whittled down 
effective reduction, effectively a, a form of disarmament that has reduced armored divisions to mere brigades or light brigades uh, and cut in substantial numbers, great swathes of the sort of military capability which we need now to defer Putin from any further adventuring. You wrote recently that Russia integrates nuclear thinking into every aspect of its military doctrine. What are the implications of that? Does it mean that the Russian military is taught to accept more readily the possibility of using nuclear weapons? Absolutely that. Absolutely. And the, 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 the use of... So a license of, for first use, in other words. Effectively license to first use. And, and not only that, but what we, what we could expect to see if Putin decides to have a go at the Baltic states and bites off a chunk of them or all of them, and NATO would be gearing up to attack, to recapture them, which would in itself be a massive military undertaking, larger than anything, frankly, we've seen since D-Day, 1944. And at that point, we could expect Russia to threaten NATO with nuclear weapons. Uh, he's got, Putin's got uh, is, uh, nuclear tipped Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad, uh, well within range of NATO cities like Berlin, Frankfurt, Copenhagen, Stockholm, uh, albeit a, 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 an allied city. Uh, and, and, and that would be a form of blackmail to, get, to make NATO stop in its tracks um, or, 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 or accept the reality of nuclear exchange. As far as you know, are there any constraints on Putin's ability to launch nuclear missiles? Can he do it by himself without reference to anyone else? Do we, do we have any idea of how his command structure works? Every, all the power for the release is in Putin's hands. I remember the words of Dmitry Peskov, I think one of his spokesmen, saying that, uh, that the decision for nuclear web, for nuclear, uh, nuclear attack would be made by, by Mr. Putin himself with the full support of the Russian people. So the, the, the sort of Politburo structure that existed in Soviet times, which could have acted as a form of check and balance, has gone. So effectively, he's got much more power than the old Soviet leaders had. I, I ask because he's being painted as a heavily armed, isolated and angry old man. And they don't necessarily make the best decisions or the most rational decisions, do they? Well, he is. He's a heavily armed, isolated, irrational, angry old man and getting older. Um, and you're absolutely right, which is why we have to be, uh, which is why we have to sit up and take notice and really be careful and really ensure. I mean, the so what out of all this is effective deterrence. And I cannot stress more strongly the need for, for NATO to gear itself up, to mobilize, uh, to be prepared, ultimately, to fight a war of national survival. Uh, and that means armed forces on a scale we have not seen since the uh, the most tense days of the Cold War, with really significant forces capable and able to operate. And that's going to mean uh, rearmament. It's going to mean reconstitution of forces. Uh, it's going to mean uh, 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 it's going to have implications on our societies in a way which we haven't seen for, for generations. The editor of one of the Russian newspapers, Nova Gazeta, Dmitry Moratov, said Putin was spinning a nuclear button around his finger like some expensive car key chain. Does Putin strike you as someone who thinks not only that he might wage a war, a nuclear war against the West, but that he could actually win it? Do you see circumstances under which he could win? I think he thinks exactly that. Uh, the circumstances in which he could win are circumstances in which deterrence has failed completely. So I come back to my argument about the importance of deterrence to preserve peace, such peace as exists. It won't be peace for Ukraine, uh, but if we want to preserve peace in NATO, that means every European nation, member state of, nation, uh, of NATO needs to put its shoulder to the wheel, dig deep and build up capability and get that capability to the to the eastern flanks of NATO as quickly as possible. I don't get a sense of the urgency that's needed. I think, on the whole, it seems to be much, very much life as usual, um, less some token reinforcement. We've got to change that mindset fundamentally. How far do you think Putin's nuclear threats reflect his frustrations with the performance so far of his forces in Ukraine? Does he have justification for feeling frustrated at what, they, what they've done or more what they haven't done in the first week? 
or Putin has no justification for thinking anything other than total abject shame and horror at what he's, what he's perpetrated on the world. But his um, forces seem but, to have made heavy weather, don't they? But uh, there's no question. They've made very heavy weather. Um, and it's, or, that indicates to me, I mean, there's, 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 there's pluses and minuses here. The plus, of course, is that it's delaying the ultimate, uh, I hope, pray not, but I, I, I fear it's delaying what might be the inevitable in Ukraine. <laughs> the, the minus is that he will be frustrated. He will be angry. He'll be angrier. He will lash out. Uh, he's already using in, uh, a, a mass artillery indiscriminately in, in Ukrainian cities like Kharkiv uh, and very likely in, Ki in Kiev as well at some stage. Uh, he, will, he, will, he will seek to apply maximum force. And if nuclear is part of that arsenal and he feels that he, which it is, and he feels it's going to give him an advantage, uh, I've no doubt that he, we should be prepared for him to use it. There are, at the moment, unconfirmed Ukrainian reports that speak of thousands of Russian casualties. Do you think that's true? Do you think they've taken heavy losses? I suspect they probably have, but at this stage, it's very difficult to validate. The fog of war covers everything. Um, the chances are that they probably have. I mean, any form of the, the sort of fighting that, we're, we're, that, we're, that, is, that is happening in, in, in Ukraine now is fighting on a scale not seen, it's seen in Europe since the Second World War. The clash of great armies of tanks and armored infantry vehicles and guns, um, a, 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 as well as all the air, air, air attacks as well. And that is going to be expensive in terms of casualties, particularly when it gets into, when there's fighting in built up areas. Fighting in cities is very casualty intensive. That's what it, soldiers it, dread most, isn't it? Fighting in the city. Well, soldiers don't like fight, don't like war anyway. That's why we 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 serve as soldiers in order to try and deter and prevent war. But if it comes to it, fighting in built-up areas is bloody, hard-working, hard work, uh, expensive on casualties, and very very slow. And it, it the chances are that it'll bog Putin down as as he goes through those cities. Whatever's happened in the first few days of this invasion, Russia presumably will take the major cities eventually. How hard will it be for them to hold them? Well, I think that's a wider question about how hard will it be? I mean, the answer is that he, he will ultimately take the major cities. How hard will it be to hold them? Very hard indeed, as it will be very hard to hold whatever Ukraine, parts of Ukraine Putin occupies, less perhaps the... Uh, the extreme eastern separatist areas of Donetsk and Luhansk. Can I say that? Uh, because I am in no doubt uh, that if and when the time comes, the Ukrainians will fight, will continue to fight. The flame of resistance will burn very brightly. Uh, it will be supported by the West and by NATO, I have no doubt. And in fact, preparations should be being made now uh, to put in place the necessary resistance, uh, su support for resistance. Uh, it'll be a very, very expensive business for Putin. He will need, need, in order to hold the cities of Ukraine and the wider Ukraine, he's going to need really significant numbers of soldiers. I saw a RAND Corporation estimate of around about six to 700,000. Well, he hasn't got that. Uh, so in a sense, that's going to result in a long, drawn-out, bloody insurgency for Putin, a form of, of, of uh, the like of which, uh, think, think Afghanistan under the Soviet attack, uh, it's going to be a hell of a lot worse for the Russians than it was for the Soviets. General Sheriff, when you, what passes through your mind when you see the beleaguered Ukrainian resistance? They're, some of them have been pushing back Russian armoured vehicles with their hands, cowering in bunkers, lining up to uh, get a rifle that they've never used in their life and not knowing whether they'll live out the day. And they want the kind of help that the West won't give them. They want closure of uh, Ukraine's airspace to Russian aircraft. How does that make you feel? Ah, desperate. On the one hand, every, every emotion in me says we, we should be coming to their help in a direct and aggressive and, uh, as, as a form, providing air support, uh, particularly when you see the, the, the shots of the, the 40 kilometer convoy bottled up and, and effectively packaged, ready for destruction and not being hit by any form of Ukrainian attack. But on the other hand, we have to think clearly here. 
we have to understand that any form, imposing any form of no-fly zone over Ukraine is an act of war. It will involve NATO aircraft shooting down Russian aircraft. It will require NATO aircraft to attack and destroy Russian air defense installations and radars on the ground. It will be an act of war, uh, and it will mean that NATO is at war with Russia. The so what for this is if you are if if you are going to go for that sort of uh, approach and in, impose a no-fly zone, you have to be prepared to fight a war of national survival. You have to have ensured that the eastern flank of NATO is absolutely solid and properly defended, and you have to be prepared for the sort of force levels required to fight on the ground and in the air in Ukraine. Uh, and I'm afraid to say that at the moment is simply out of the question. General Sheriff, so, so the West saying it stands with Ukraine um, doesn't really represent the truth. It, it's an uncomfortable thought, isn't it, that if NATO had given Ukraine what it was demanding for years, that's to say NATO, NATO membership, they probably wouldn't be in this position now, would they? <sighs> well... <laughs> Again, the same, a similar argument applies to NATO membership of Ukraine. And of course, NATO promised, you're absolutely right, NATO promised membership of Ukraine, uh, of NATO to Ukraine back at the Bucharest summit in 2008 at some stage. However, one of the facts of life is you don't make a promise if you can't keep it. Uh, you, you know, over promise, uh, to, to over promise and under deliver is a fundamental mistake. And that is the mistake that NATO has made. Because if if Ukraine was to be a member of NATO, NATO would have had to have deployed sufficient defensive forces in Ukraine to deter any Russian attack. This would have needed a NATO force stationed permanently in Ukraine. Think back to the NATO force in West Germany in the Cold War, a force of two to 300,000 soldiers, together with all the equipment and paraphernalia of war. Was NATO really going to do that back in 2008, 9, 10? I don't think there was a political chance in hell of that happening. So again, we come back to the point about if NATO was to accept Ukraine into the alliance, NATO would need to be prepared, would have needed to have been prepared to defend it to the teeth with really significant armed forces. And that, I'm afraid to say, was never going to happen. You say that, but in recent years, Mr. Putin hasn't made much of a secret of his expansionist aims, his desire to compensate, as he calls it, for the collapse of the Soviet Union. Marching into Georgia, for instance, in 2008, Crimea, six years later, was a pretty powerful statement of his direction of travel. And all he got was a slap on the wrist, a few invitations withdrawn, a few sanctions. The punishment didn't fit the crime, did it? If it had... Do you think he could have been dissuaded from the path he's on now? I've no doubt he could have been, yes. And if you read the foreword to my, my book, I talk about was Georgia our, our Rhineland and was, 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 was Crimea our Sudetenland moment? Uh, and I pose the question, what will be our Poland moment? There are real parallels here with the 1930s. Um, and if you think back, for example, in the British context to 2010, uh, a significant reduction in the size of the armed forces, particularly the regular army, the dismantling of the only armored division we had. Uh, four years later, you get Crimea. Uh, and at the time, I well remember the British politicians when, or shortly afterwards, actually, 2016, British politicians, when, when, when challenged on whether there was a threat for Russia, saying, I do not know anybody who thinks like that. There was a degree of complacency and a failure to really look at Putin, listen to what Putin was saying, and think through the implications. Do you buy the story that the West lost him at some point along the way? When he came to power, there was even talk of Russia joining NATO at some point. Wasn't there even a, a sort of friendly, fuzzy period between East and West? Did the West screw that up? There's two sides for every story, and I, I, you're absolutely right. At, at one stage, I think in '99, when he came to power, he said he wouldn't rule out joining Russia, Russia joining NATO. Um, I don't necessarily buy the story that the West lost him. I think I can remember well Tony Blair in good faith making saying that he thought that Putin, when he came to power, was a man with whom we could do business. No, I think what you see is a man who has increasingly 
uh, become corrupted by power, absolutely corrupted by power, uh, and who has decided that the return of the politics of iron and blood to Europe suits his intentions. You've basically been describing for the last few minutes an alliance, the NATO alliance, that isn't fit for purpose. When you, when you look at the huge resources available to NATO countries and the relatively meager pot that Russia can access, how is it that Moscow seems to be calling the shots? I ask because year after year, defense experts have said NATO would have been hard put to win a war with Russia. And now we're, according to you, at least uh, on a path that could take us to a war. How is that? Ultimately, decisions about the size and shape and funding of armed forces are made by our political leadership, uh, not by, not by the, the specialists who have to carry it out. And that is quite right in a democracy that, that it is the you know, civil power of the military. Um, and the, the fundamental reason is that our political leadership, our electorates, have not been particularly in Europe uh, especially in Europe, because I think it's different in America, I would add Canada to the European basket here, have not been prepared to invest adequately in defence. They have preferred to invest in social security and education and other spending, uh, because that's what gets them elected. Defence has never been an electoral issue uh, in this, uh, it, it, up, up until the, you know, throughout the last, last decade, two decades, three decades. You've talked of the West needing to adapt now to a new reality. You said the world that we knew before February 24th, in which the rights of sovereign states to live in peace was guaranteed by a respect for international law without armed force, that's gone forever. How is the West supposed to behave in this bleak new world that you envisage? Well, it's got to get real. It's got, firstly, to... The imperative is deterrence. It's got, first of all, to muster and mobilize the capability to prevent any further incursions by, by Putin into, into in any incursion into the NATO territory. Uh, but it's got to think long term. It's got to recognize that we are in here in for the long haul here. There are not going to be any quick fixes. Uh, there's not going to be any comfort in that. This is going to need, in the very best case, a significant NATO deterrence force all the way from Poland to Romania. It'll dwarf the NATO, the, the requirement uh, that NATO faced during the Cold War for a significant force in West Germany. This is a much, much longer commitment and a much bigger commitment. Do you now, think the we... US has the will for that? Well, we'll have to see. Um, you know, we're getting I mean, the last all the... president, the previous president, didn't have much will. No. He didn't like NATO at all, and it would probably uh, have collapsed. And you're him. right. This is this is the hundred. This is the million dollar question. Whether whether Putin whether, whether you're absolutely right under Trump, that who showed Trump just demonstrated contempt for NATO and contempt for his closest allies, and in a sense cozied up to our potential adversaries. And, and what if he Trump comes back did, and if he wins the election in 2024, NATO's been big trouble, isn't it? Well, by that stage, we'll know which way, which the way the, crook, the cookie has crumbled. But, but the bottom line with Trump is that he broke that fundamental trust that whatever president occupied the White House, there was total certainty that America would come to the aid of a NATO member of attack. Trump, Trump broke that. I think under Biden, we're in a better place. I hope we are under President Biden. Uh, but again, I, I would like to see uh, significant numbers of real warfighting capability being shipped across the Atlantic now. I see no signs of that at the moment, and we do need to see that. For example, in, you know, in the Cold War, the, the Americans routinely redeployed armored divisions from, from America to Germany, West Germany, as part of reinforcement exercises, the reforger exercises, just to demonstrate that they could. They need to start doing that again now. Likely armed airborne troops is not enough. You, as I said, painted this bleak picture, but haven't the incredibly brave, selfless Ukrainian fighters who are battling against overwhelming odds, haven't they shown us a vision of a much better future that could be? Haven't they given NATO some inspiration 
Oh, unquestionably. They, they've been, they, they are inspiring beyond belief. And to see, you know, the fact, the way the, the, the Ukrainians have, have, have fought is extraordinary. But, but let's not kid ourselves. Brave men and women with anti-tank weapons and Molotov cocktails are not going to stop guards tank armies. Uh, look at what look at the co the convoy that we've all been looking at the satellite pictures of. Where is the destruction of that? Why has that not? Why have the Ukrainians not been able to attack that? What worries me is that their air force is not capable to do, capable enough to do it, uh, and or they are unable to maneuver the necessary armored formations to do it. But there is a force, an enemy force, which has been packaged for destruction and advantage cannot be taken or appears not to be taken. So that's what really worries me. General Sir Richard Shiraf, thank you very much for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you. Thank you.